Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has announced his resignation over health concerns. He says he did not want his health to get in the way of decision making and apologized to the Japanese people for failing to complete his term in office. The nation's longest serving Prime Minister also says it's not up to him to decide on his successor. He will, however, continue to serve until the next leader is appointed. And for a closer look, let's speak to Assistant Professor Michael Kuchek. He's an expert in Japanese politics from Temple University. Thank you very much, Professor Kuchek, for joining us. So Shinzo Abe, he is Japan's longest serving prime minister. Will his departure, sudden departure, threaten the stability of Japanese politics? Any of the rivals who are now maneuvering in order to get into position to take over for Shinzo Abe are basically the same kind of politician that he is. So in terms of the types of persons or the types of policies that will come out, we're not going to see a lot of change. Uh, there is basically a, a single form of a Japanese politician in the senior ranks, uh, usually a legacy politician, as Mr. Abe is. Uh, whose family has been in the business of politics for many generations. And those persons are basically the only possible uh, people who could become prime minister at the present time. So it's going to look a lot the same. Professor Kuchek, I mean, in that light, Mr. Abe has said that he, he's not going to play a part in choosing who his successor is. Do we know if there is consensus as to who this person may be. There's also speculation about who it might be. There's been no real sense of who's got the juice, as it were. The various faction heads, the LDP is divided into a series of long-term divisions called factions. These various faction heads all are possible candidates to become the prime minister. And usually they have some kind of process to determine amongst themselves uh, who is the best uh, or, or is best placed to take over. That process has been never taken place during the period of time that Mr. Abe uh, has been prime minister. There's no clear successor. And therefore, we're really walking into the unknown. So with no clear successor in sight, what then are the key issues he will have to take on being Mr. Abe's successor? Because we know he's going to be in there just for a short period until September 1st next year, because that's when Mr. Abe's term ends. Okay. The first one, of course, is the management of uh, the COVID-19 epidemic. Japan's pathway has been, ver has been unique. It has taken its own way uh, in terms of number of tests made, uh, the kinds of people who get tested, and uh, what to an extent the country is either open or locked down. Uh, that next prime minister will have to decide on the next steps. Where Do we try to go for complete eradication or for living with COVID? That's job one. In the background, grinding away always is the growth and power of China. Uh, that is job one most of the time for a Japanese prime minister, living with a, an economically, diplomatically, militarily more uh, capable China. Now, I wouldn't say more aggressive, not necessarily, but certainly one which will have more tools at its disposal. That has been always been a very important part and will be a big important part. Finally, uh, climate change and the consequences of it, which are battering uh, both uh, China and Japan and everyone in the region and everywhere and in the world. Uh, Japan was once a leader uh, in this department. Uh, then we had the uh, 311 disaster and the shutting down of Japan's nuclear power plants uh, and the increase in Japan's uh, CO2 emissions consequently after that. Getting Japan back as a central force in climate change action uh, will be a major part of a future prime minister. Mr. Abe was not able to do it. Uh, the next prime minister uh, needs to get uh, really address it much more aggressively. Professor Kucha, you've alluded in that answer to the fact that Mr. Abe uh, as, as a future prime minister would also need to do, that he, during his term at least, reached out to other regional neighbours, 
uh, as, as a counter to China's rise during his, uh, his terms in office. How would you describe, though, his legacy? I would say that, that he provides the idea that Japanese prime ministers can be long-lasting. Uh, he has established that uh, after a long series of prime ministers that lasted only a year, and uh, most people have forgotten their names, uh, not me, of course, it's my speciality. But uh, he has also established the relatively uh, forgotten importance of the United States uh, in East Asia. He went out of his way to abnegate himself before Donald Trump, which a man with a great deal of pride uh, for, that, for that to happen uh, was quite amazing. But he and understood and, and really, really tried to make Donald Trump understand that the United States is intrinsic to the order of East Asia. And the next prime minister, how he will deal with the, prime, the American president who's elected in November, uh, that will be a crucial part of keeping Japan in the place where it is in East Asia and uh, keeping the order of Asia all together uh, in one piece. And so Mr. Abe's legacy uh, is understanding, despite the fact that he was a Japanese patriot and a highly nationalistic one, that there has to be an international American-led uh, order in East Asia to provide a structure uh, for better relations for everyone. Professor, thank you very much for that insight. We've been speaking there to Assistant Professor Michael Kuchek, an expert in Japanese politics from Temple University.